And the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Now Jesus said to his disciples, Fear no one. Nothing is concealed that will not be revealed, or a secret that will not be known. And what I say to you in, in darkness, you are to speak in the light. And what you hear whispered, you are to proclaim on the housetops. And do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. No, rather, you are to be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Are not two sparrows sold for a small coin? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's knowledge. Even all the hairs on your head have been counted. So do not be afraid. You're worth more than many, many sparrows. For every one of you who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my heavenly Father. But whoever denies me before others, I will deny before my heavenly Father. The Gospel of the Lord. I want to uh, look today at, at the fear factor because we are living in some incredibly fearful times for a whole bunch of people. And of course, one of my favorite tropes is that, that somebody actually counted them. There are 367 times that either one of the disciples or one of the prophets or Jesus himself says, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. And yet there is a, a great deal of fear around us. Some fear is justified. It makes perfect sense. We are wearing our masks today because uh, we are afraid that we might infect someone else or might be infected ourselves. We keep our distance right now because we don't want to continue. That's a, that's a valid fear. But the other fears we've got to really take a look at because I think they are debilitating us and keeping us from being the people that Christ is calling us to be. You know, I think one of the most dangerous proverbs is the one that says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Maybe awe might be a better word, but we have always translated this to be afraid. As a matter of fact, I dare to say when we were little kids, we were taught to be afraid of God, you know, because he's, he's watching. You better not shout. You better not cry. He sees everything that's going on up there, you know. And even when we went to confession, what do we say? For those of us at a certain age, the way we learned how to go to confession was to say that I'm confessing my sins because I, I dread the loss of heaven and the fear of hell. They put the fear of hell into us. And that made us very scrupulous. I was raised as a scrupulous little boy. I can remember on the day of my first communion being afraid that I had broken my fast because I swallowed my spit. <laughs> Thank God I've kind of grown out of that a little bit. I think there's a, there's a new scrupulosity coming back that no matter what we do, it's just not going to be right because we're going to be, well, because most of all, they have offended thee, my God. Well, I, I want to stay categorically. You can't offend God. Okay? Ken Wilber once says, much more pain has been brought into the world by people taking offense than by people giving offense. You can sadden the Holy Spirit. You know, Paul says, don't sadden the Holy Spirit. I think the Holy Spirit gets sad every time he sees us not paying attention to where the Spirit is leading us. That's a sadness. But offense, I think the only way, you, the reason you can't offend God is because you have to have an ego to be offended. <laughs> and there's no ego in God. It's my reputation that is hurt and my good name that is hurt or whatever it is that I put out there that I think I am and, and you have not appreciated it so I just get all crushed and hurt, that's offensive. No, it's not. Not to God. And yet, we think that God is somehow going to be very offended and, and get us. George Carlin, in one of his anti-religion rages, tells the story of, he says, and, and then we believe that up there somewhere there's an invisible man. And the invisible man is watching you down there. And the invisible man, he's got 10 things he doesn't want you to do. But if you do these 10 things, the invisible man's going to take you and cast you down to hell and make you miserable and whip you for all eternity. 
but he loves you. <laughs> Truth be told, that's exactly what Jesus is saying in the gospel today. He says, look it. He says, I don't want you to be afraid of whoever can hurt the body, but not the soul. You want to be afraid? Let me raise this exponentially. I'm going to put the fear of God in you. All right? Be afraid of the one who cannot, after the body is dead, take the soul and cast it into Gehenna. Are you scared? I want you scared witless. Now, let me tell you, a sparrow doesn't fall down to the ground. A sparrow worth what? Two farthings? It doesn't fall to the ground without your heavenly Father knowing it. And you are worth much, much more than a sparrow, little flock. So you are to be afraid of nothing. Every hair on your head is counted. Now, for some of us, that's really easy to do. <laughs> yeah. What he's saying is that we are to be afraid of nothing. No fear. Then the reason he's saying that is because we've got some work to do. If indeed we are the Christ in space and time, as we said last week, if we are the body of Christ, we've got a job to do. And what's our job? Well, I think the job that we need to do right now more than anything else is prophetic. It's prophetic. You know, when we were baptized and the council was so clear, when we were baptized, we received a priesthood, we received a kingly mark, charism, and then the, the, the charism of prophecy. Would that all of my people were prophets. Well, we are. And we are like Jeremiah being sent forth. Now, we got a thousand excuses as why we should not be going. You know, Jeremiah was, I'm, I'm too young. You know, Isaiah says, ah, I, I got a potty mouth, you know, and he wouldn't hear any of that. Now, when you speak what a prophet is to speak, and of course, the job of a prophet is to speak truth to power. There's always going to be pushback. I mean, we find Jeremiah word today in, in stocks. He's the laughing stock because he is saying things that nobody wants to hear. And yet we are constantly called to speak that truth to power. Where do we begin? If we're going to be prophetic, where do we begin? I think where we really need to begin is in here. If we're going to be really prophetic, first thing we need to do is shadow work. And shadow work is, is the willingness to go inside of myself to find out where those dark spaces are that are unacceptable to me, that I don't want to think about, that I don't want to look at. My shadow work right now is to find out what is the log in my eye that is keeping me from seeing the speck in my sister or my brother's eye to take out. And as I've mentioned before, the, the remnants, the, the enzymes of, of the racism which, which I was raised are still there. And I, I got to look at that. You see, we can't erase what we don't face. And so I think we need to first face it in ourselves. Now, once that's done, now go out. Start marching, start writing, start petitioning, start talking. And there's a reason it is absolutely critical at this point in space and time. And the reason it's critical right now is that this is a Kairos moment. This is not, you know, we know, you know the difference between Cronus and Kairos. You know, Cronus is a succession of moments, one after the other after the other. Kairos is boom, when it's the fullness of time, when time stops. You know, in the fullness of time, what? The divine became one of us and dwelt among us. In the fullness of time. In the fullness of a time when a woman is about to give birth, we talk about when her time has come. I really believe, and not just for us right here, worldwide, the time has come. This is a critical moment. In my lifetime, I've never experienced a moment like this and the convergence of so many things that are happening all at the same time. So it is a true Kairos moment. Are we going to give birth? My mother used to say, <laughs> she said, anytime one man felt one labor pain, the world would end. <laughs> birth is messy. Birth hurts. Birth is painful. You know, and what do you got to do? You got to push. And then you got to get, and there will always be a little bit of, there will always be pushback. But we keep on pushing because this is, this is the moment. This is the moment. And, and we, 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 we have to do it. And we've got the equipment to do it. We've got the ability to do it. 
all the things that we have heard from the time we entered the convent to the time that we entered our first religious education class to the time we entered the seminary, all the things we heard in that little classroom, the things I told you in secret, you are now to proclaim from the rooftops. What are we called to proclaim? So what's the message we have to proclaim? It's the message of Jesus. What's the message of Jesus? Repent. Turn around. You know, the Greek word is metanoia. What is metanoia? Metanoia means metanous. It's a higher mind. We are called to put on the mind of Christ and proclaim what Christ proclaimed. What does Christ proclaim? That all may be one. There's no gradation between the good people and the bad people, between even the saved and the unsaved. We are called to proclaim the mercy and love of God. And we should do it with utter confidence. You know, St. Paul writes in Romans today uh, that lovely passage about Adam and then Christ is the new Adam. But I, I wish they would have gone a little bit further because a little bit further in, in chapter 5, Paul says, where, where sin abounds and we're living in a very sinful situation, grace will superabound. The grace is here. It's our birthright. It's been given to each and every one of us. And the question is, are we going to do it? Earlier this morning, I was listening to NPR, and, and there was a mother who had one of her babies killed at Sandy Hook. And she was absolutely convinced that we would do something about it. And she said, you know what? The politicians were just waiting for us to forget about it. She says, we cannot forget this time. She said, the reason is I am married to a black man and have a black son. A white man with a huge armory of guns killed my baby daughter. And now my black son who walks out unarmed is in harm's way. What are we going to do about it? Grace is on our side. It is the grace of God that is propelling us. This is a moment unlike no other. Carpe diem. Seize the day.